Pallas Athena now inspired Diomedes, son of Tydeus, with audacity and resolution so that he might eclipse all his comrades in arms and cover himself with glory. She made his shield and helmet glow with a blaze as steady as the star of summer when he rises from his bath in ocean to outshine all the other stars. Such was the fire that she caused to stream from his head and shoulders as she thrust him into the very heart of the battle. There was a Trojan called Darius, a wealthy citizen of good repute, who was priest of Hephaestus. He had two sons, Phegus and Aideus, both trained in every kind of fighting. These two detached themselves from the rest and advanced against Diomedes and their chariot, while well, he went to meet them on foot. When they had come within range, Phegeus began the fight by hurling his long-shadowed spear. But the spear point passed over Diomedes' left shoulder and did not touch him. It was now Diomedes' turn to cast, and his weapon did not leave his hand for nothing. It struck Phegeus in the middle of the breast and tumbled him out of the well-made chariot, which Aideus then deserted also, with a leap to the rear, not daring to bestride his brother's corpse. Black fate would have got him too if Hephaestus had not come to the rescue and wrapped him in night, saving him so that his aged priest might not be utterly broken by grief. The magnificent Diomedes drove the men's horses off and told his followers to take them back to the hollow ships. When the Trojans saw what happened to Darius' sons, how one was killed beside his chariot and the other put to flight, they were dismayed for all their bravery. Moreover, it was at this point that Athene of the Bright Eyes interposed and laid a restraining hand on the arm of the fierce war god. Ares. She cried. Murderous Ares, butcher of men and sacker of towns, is it not time for us to let the Trojans and Achaeans fight it out and see whom Father Zeus intends to win? Let us two leave the field before we make him happy. With this, Athene led the impetuous war god out of the fight and made him sit down on the grassy bank of Scamander. As a result, the Danaeans thrust back the Trojan line, and each of the leaders killed his man. Agamemnon, king of men, began by hurling the great Odeus, chief of the Alizones, from his chariot. Odeus had been the first to fly, and as he turned, Agamemnon caught him in the back with his spear, midway between the shoulders, and drove it through his breast. He fell with a thud, and his armor rang about him. Next, Idomnus killed Phaestus, son of Meonian Boris, who had come from the fertile lands of Tarni. As Phaestus was getting into his chariot, the great spearman pierced his right shoulder with a long javelin. Phaestus crashed down from his car, and hateful night engulfed him. Idomeneus' retainers stripped his corpse. Then Menelaus, son of Atreus, with his sharp-pointed spear, killed the hunter Scamandrius, son of Strophius. He was a great man for the chase, who had been taught by Artemis herself to bring down any kind of wild game that the mountain forest yields. But Artemis, the mistress of the bow, was no help for him now. Nor were the long shots that had won him such fame. For as Scamandrius fled before him, the glorious spearman Menelaus, son of Atreus, struck him with his lance in the middle of the back, between the shoulders, and drove it through his chest. He fell face downward, and his armor clanged upon him. Next, Meriones killed Phericles, son of Tecton, Harmon's son, a carpenter who could turn his hand to any kind of curious work. Pallas Athena had no greater favorite. It was he who had built for Paris those trim ships that had started all the trouble and proved a curse to the whole Trojan people, and to himself, since he knew nothing of oracles. Meriones ran after him, and when he caught him up, struck him in the right buttock. The spearhead passed clean through the bladder under the bone. He dropped on his knees with a scream, and death enveloped him. Then Megis killed Pythias, an illegitimate son of Antinor's, whom to please her husband, the gracious lady Theano had brought up like a child of her own. Megis, the mighty spearman, caught up to this man and struck him with a sharp lance on the nape of the neck. The point came out between his jaws and severed his tongue at the root. He fell down in the dust and bit the cold bronze with his teeth. Meanwhile, Eurypylus, Euaemon's son, killed the noble Hypasenor, son of the proud Dolopian, who served as a priest to the river god's commander and was worshipped by the Trojan people. As he fled before him, Eurypylus, Euaemon's highborn son, gave chase and slashed at Hypsenor's shoulder with his sword. The man's great arm was shorn off and fell bleeding to the ground. Fate set her seal on him, and the shadow of death fell over his eyes. Such was the execution done by the Danaean front line in this assault. As for Diomedes himself, you could not have told which army, Trojan or Achaean, he belonged to. He stormed across the plain like a winter torrent that comes tearing down and flattens out the dikes. Against its sudden onslaught, backed by the heavy rains, nothing can stand. Neither the dikes that were meant to hem it in, nor the stone walls round the vineyards and their sturdy trees. 
It has its way, and far and wide the farmers see the wreckage of their splendid work. Thus, the Trojans in their serried lines collapsed before the son of Tydeus, unable for all their numbers to withstand him. When the noble Pandarus, Lycaon's son, saw Diomedes storming across the plain and driving companies before him, he lost no time, but bent his crooked bow, took aim at him, and struck him as he forged ahead in the right shoulder on a plate of his cuirass. Piercing the plate, the sharp arrow pressed straight on, and blood spread over the cuirass. Pandarus raised a great shout of triumph over Diomedes. Trojans! He cried. Forward and at them! Forward, charioteers! The best man they've got is badly wounded, and he won't last much longer, if King Apollo was in earnest when he sent me here from Lycia. Pandarus could boast, yet Diomedes was not beaten by the bitter dart. He fell back, but came to a halt by his horses and chariot, and called to Stenelus, son of Capaneus. Ah, Stenelus, quick! Draw this arrow from my shoulder! Stenelus leapt from the chariot to the ground, came over to him and pulled out the arrow clean through his shoulder. The blood came gushing through his knitted tunic, and Diomedes of the loud war cry offered up a prayer to Athene. O oh, Athene, I pray to thee, unsleeping child of Zeus, if ever in the past you wished us well and stood by my father or myself in the heat of action, be kind to me again. Let me kill Pandarus. Bring me within spear cast of the man who shot me. I never had a chance. And now he's telling people I'm as good as dead. Diomedes' prayer came to the ears of Pallas Athena, and she made a new man of him. She came and stood by him too and spoke momentous words. Now, Diomedes, you can fight the Trojans fearlessly. I have filled your heart with the audacity of your father Tydeus, the great shield-bearing charioteer. Also... I have swept the mist from your eyes and made you able to distinguish gods from men. And I tell you now, in case a god comes here to put you to the test, that you must not fight against the immortals, with one exception only. If Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, comes into the battle, use your sharp bronze and wound her. With that, bright-eyed Athene disappeared, and the son of Tydeus went and took his place once more in the front line. Even without Athene, he had been determined to fall on the enemy again. And now, he was three times as bold as he had been before, like a lion that a shepherd in charge of the woolly sheep on an outlying farm has wounded as he leapt into the yard, but failed to kill. He has only roused him to greater fury, and now he cannot keep him off, but hides in the stables, deserting the sheep in their panic. They are mown down in heaps, and the lion, furious still, jumps the high wall, and so gets out of the yard. It was with such fury that the mighty Diomedes charged the Trojan line. He began by killing Astyanus, and a chieftain called Hyperion. He struck the one above the nipple with his bronze-pointed spear, and the other with his great sword on the collarbone by the shoulder, so that the shoulder was severed from the neck and back. He left them lying there, and went in chase of Abbas and Polyedus, the sons of Eurydamus, an old man who believed in dreams. But he had no dreams to expound to these two when they set out for the front, and the mighty Diomedes killed them both. Then he went after Xanthus and Thuon, son of Phanops, a pair of striplings whose father, by now an old and ailing man, had had no other son to whom he could bequeath his wealth. They were next to fall. Diomedes slew them both, leaving their father brokenhearted. He never saw them in the flesh again home from war. It was their cousins who stepped into their estate. Diomedes' next victims were the two sons of Dardanian Priam, Echemon and Chromius, who were riding in the same chariot. Like a lion who pounces on cattle feeding in a glade and breaks an ox's or heifer's neck, the son of Tydeus tumbled them rudely out of their chariot, without so much as a by your leave. Then he stripped them of their arms, and gave their horses to his men to drive to the ships. Aeneas, seeing what havoc Diomedes was making of the Trojans' lines, set out through the melee and the rain of missiles in search of Prince Pandarus. When he found the noble and stalwart son of Lycan, he went up to him at once. Pandarus, he said, what are you doing with your bow and your winged arrows? Are you not supposed to be an archer, the best that Lycia can boast? better than anyone in Troy. For heaven's sake, man, put a prayer to Zeus and let fly at that fellow over there. I don't know who it is, but he is having it all his own way and that has done too much harm to us already and brought many of our best men down. Yet be careful, he may be one of the immortals annoyed with us for some shortcoming in our rights. Perhaps we are being punished by an angry god. Lycaon's noble son saluted Aeneas with the respect due to a Trojan counselor. If you ask me, he said, the man is Diomedes, son of Tydeus. I recognize him by his shield and the visor of his helmet. I know his horses too when I see them, and yet, I cannot swear that he is not a god. But if he is the man I take him for, 
the formidable Diomedes. I see the hand of heaven in this mad attack of his. Some god must surely have been standing by him, wrapped in haze, to have made my arrow swerve as it hit him. For I have shot at him, and I hit him in the right shoulder, clean through the plate of the cuirass. I certainly thought I had seen him off to Hades, and yet I did not kill him. So perhaps it is some angry god. And here I am, without a chariot and horses to carry me, while all the time I have eleven splendid chariots at home, fresh from the Wainwright's hands, with hide spread over them, and a couple of horses standing by each, mulching white barley and rye. There, in the palace before I left for the front, my father Lycaon, the old spearman, told me time and again that I ought to lead the men from a war chariot when we engaged the enemy. But I would not listen to him, better for me if I had. I thought of my horses, who had always had enough to eat, and was afraid that fodder might run short in the congested city. So I left and came to Ilium on foot, relying on archery. Not that archery was going to do me any good, for I have already shot at a couple of their best men, Diomedes and Menelaus, and in each case, I scored a hit and drew blood, there's no doubt about it. But I only roused them to greater efforts. Yes, I did an unlucky thing when I took my crooked bow from its peg. That day I set out with my company for your lovely town to please Prince Hector. But if I ever get home again and set eyes on my own country and my wife and the high roof of my great house... I shall be ready to let anybody cut my head off then and there, if I don't smash this bow with my own hands and throw it in the blazing fire. The thing is of no earthly use to me. Don't talk like that, said the Trojan commander Aeneas. Yet it is true enough that nothing can be done to stop the man till you and I get into a chariot and attack him with other weapons. Come, mount my car, and you will see what horses of the breed of Tros are like, and how quickly mine can cover the ground. It makes no difference which way you drive them, in flight or in pursuit. We can rely on them to get us safely into Troy if Zeus gives up Diomedes, son of Tydeus, yet another victory. Come now, take the whip and reins, and when the time comes, I will dismount and do the fighting. Or let me take care of the horses, leaving you to stand up to the men. Aeneas, Lycaon's noble son, replied, Take the reins yourself and drive your own horses. They will pull the chariot better with their usual driver behind them, if presently we have to run away from Tydeus's son. They might take fright and resist when they missed your voice and refused to take us off the field. Then the indomitable Diomedes would close in, finish us off, and drive away our horses. So handle your own chariot and pair, and when the man comes up, I will receive him with my spear. This point decided, they mounted the decorated car and resolutely drove their fast pair in Diomedes' direction. Stenelus, the noble son of Capaneus, saw them and promptly warned Tydides. My lord, he said, my dears Diomedes, here come two stalwarts bent on fighting you, a formidable pair. One is the bowman Pandorus, who calls himself Lycaon's son. The other is Aeneas, who can name the lord Anchises as his father, and Aphrodite as his mother. Quick, let us fall back in the chariot. I beg you not to storm about in the front line anymore, or you may lose your life! The mighty Diomedes gave him an angry look. Don't talk to me of flight, Stenelus, he said. You will not persuade me. It is not in my nature to evade a fight or run away. I am as strong as ever. I will go meet them as I am. Pallas Athene lets me show no cowardice. As for those two, their horses may be fast, but it will not save them from us, even if one escapes. Now listen, do not forget what I say. If Athene, with her infinite wisdom, allows me to kill them both, leave our horses here and concentrate on the horses of Aeneas. Seize them and drive them out of the Trojan lines, into our own. For I tell you, they are bred from the same stock as those that the all-seeing Zeus gave Tros in return for his boy Ganymedes, and they are the best horses in the world. Later, Prince Anchises stole the breed by putting mares to them without Laomedon's consent. The mares fold in, in his stables, and of the six horses that he got, he kept four for himself and reared them at the manger, but gave those two to Aeneas for use in battle. If we could capture them, we could cover ourselves with glory. While they were talking, the other two driving this pair of thoroughbreds came up to them at a gallop, and Pandarus, the noble son of Lycaon, called across to them. So, the stubborn Diomedes has survived my shot and braves it out? A son of the haughty Tydeus is not to be brought down by an arrow. Well, I shall try him with the spear this time and see what that will do. With this, he poised and hurled his long shadow javelin and struck Tydides' shield. The bronze head pierced the shield and reached the man's cuirass. 
Like hands, Noble Sun raised a shout of triumph over him. A hit! Clean through the flank! You won't stand up to that for long, and what a triumph I shall have to thank you for! A miss! Ha <laughs> ha! Said the powerful Diomedes, unperturbed. You never touched me? What is more, I fancy that before you two are done, one or the other is going to fall and glut the stubborn god of battle with his blood. With that, Diomedes cast. His spear, guided by Athene, struck Pandarus on the nose beside the eye and passed through his white teeth. His tongue was cut off at the root by the relentless bronze and the point came out at the base of his chin. He crashed from the chariot. His burnished scintillating armor rang out upon him and the horses shied, thoroughbreds though they were. This was the end of Pandarus. Aeneas leapt down from the chariot with his shield and his long spear, fearing that the Achaeans might try and rob him of the corpse. He now bestrode it like a lion in the pride of his power, covering it with his spear and his round shield, determined to kill any and all comers, uttering his terrible war cry. Diomedes picked up a lump of rock. Even to lift it was a feat beyond the strength of any two men bred today, but Diomedes handled it alone, without an effort. With this, he struck Aeneas on the hip, where the thigh turns at the hip joint, the cup bone as they call it. He crushed the cup bone, and he broke both sinews too. The skin was lacerated by the jagged boulder, the noble Aeneas sank to his knees and supported himself with one great hand on the ground. But the world went black as night before his eyes. Indeed, the prince would have perished there and then, but for the quickness of his mother, Zeus's daughter Aphrodite, who had conceived him for Anchises when he was looking after the cattle. Seeing what had happened, she threw her white arms around her beloved son and drew a fold of her shibbling robe across him to protect him from flying weapons in a fatal spear cast to the breast from the Danaean charioteers. While Aphrodite was rescuing her son from the field, Stenelus, not forgetting the instructions he had from Diomedes of the Loud War Cry, tied his horse's reins to the chariot rail, left them kicking their heels some way from the scene of turmoil, and made a dash for Aeneas' long-maned pair. Seizing these, he drove them out of the Trojan into the Achaean lines, where he handed them over to Dipleus, a comrade in arms who he had liked and trusted more than any other man of his own age, and who had often proved his loyalty. After telling Dipleus to drive the pair back to the hollow ships, the gallant Stenelus mounted his chariot, grasped the shining reins, and drove his powerful horses off at a gallop in quest of Diomedes, whom he was eager to rejoin. Diomedes himself had gone in relentless pursuit of Cyprian Aphrodite, realizing that this was some timid goddess and not one of those who play a dominating part in the battles of mankind such as Athene or Enyo, Sacker of Towns. After a long chase through the crowd, the son of the great-hearted Tydeus came up with his quarry and leapt to the attack. He made a lunge at her, and with his sharp spear cut her gentle hand at the base of the palm. The point, tearing the imperishable robe which the graces had made for her, pierced the flesh where the palm joins the wrist. Out came the goddess's immortal blood, the ichor that runs in the veins of the happy gods, who eat no bread nor drink our sparkling wine, and so are bloodless and are called immortals. Aphrodite gave a piercing scream and dropped her son, whom Phoebus Apollo took into his arms and wrapped in a dark blue cloud, save him from the fatal spear cast in the breast from the Danaean charioteers. Diomedes of the loud war cry raised a great shout of triumph over Aphrodite. Daughter of Zeus, he cried, be off from this battle and leave war alone. Is it not enough for you to set your traps for feeble womenfolk? If you persist in joining the fight, you will be taught to tremble at the very name of war. Cowed by his threatening attitude and distraught with pain, Aphrodite withdrew. Her lovely skin was stained with blood, and the wound was smarting grievously. But Iris of the Whirlwind Feet took charge of her and led her out of the turmoil. To the left of the battlefield, Aphrodite found the turbulent war god, seated on the ground with his spear and vast horses resting on a cloud. Sinking to her knees, she implored her brother for the loan of his horses with the golden harness on their heads. See me safe, my dear brother, she said. Let me have your horses to get me to Olympus where the immortals live. I am in great pain from a wound that was given me by a mortal man, the son of Tydeus, who is in a mood now to fight with Father Zeus himself. Ares lent her the horses with the golden harness, and Aphrodite mounted the chariot in great distress. Iris got in beside her, took the reins in her hands, and flicked the horses with the whip to make them start. The willing pair flew off, and before long they reached the steep heights of Olympus, where the gods have their home. There, fleet Iris of the whirlwind feet brought the horses to a halt, unyoked them from the car, and threw ambrosial fodder down beside them, while lovely Aphrodite went to her mother Dione and sank down at her knees. Dione took her daughter up in her arms and spoke to her fondly as she stroked her with her hand. 
Dear child, she said, which of the heavenly ones has hurt you now like this, out of mere spite as though you were a branded felon? Laughter-loving Aphrodite told her tale. That bully Diomedes, son of Tydeus, wounded me because I was rescuing my own beloved son Aeneas, my favorite from the battlefield. This war has ceased to be a struggle between Trojans and Achaeans. The Danaeans are fighting now against the gods themselves. To this, the gracious goddess Dione replied, Endure, my child, and face your troubles gallantly. Many of us that live here on Olympus have suffered at the hands of men in our attempts to injure one another. Ares, for one, had to suffer when Otis and the mighty Aphiliates, the children of Alois, threw him into chains. He spent thirteen months trussed up in a bronze jar, and that would have been the end of Ares and his appetite for war if the beautiful Eriboea, the young giant stepmother, had not told Hermes what they had done. Ares' strength was on the point of giving out when Hermes spirited him away. The fetters nearly proved too much for him. Hera suffered too, when the powerful Hercules, Amphitryon's son, struck her with a three-barbed arrow in the right breast. She was in agony, and the monstrous Hades himself was wounded by an arrow and had to bear it like the rest, when the same man, the son of Aegis bearing Zeus, shot him at the gate of hell among the dead and left him to his anguish. Sick at heart and in excruciating pain, Hades found his way to high Olympus and the palace of Zeus. The arrow had driven into his shoulder muscles and was draining his strength. However, Paeon, the healer, spread soothing ointments on the wound and cured him, for after all, he was not made of mortal stuff. But think of the audacity, think of the savagery of the man, who cared so little what wickedness he set his hand to, that he plagued the very gods of Olympus with his bow. As for your trouble, it was Athene of the flashing eyes who told the man to chase you. But Diomedes is a fool. He does not know how short life is for the man who fights against immortals. For him, there is no homecoming from war and his horrors. No little children gathering at his knees to call him father. So let Tydides, strong man as he is, take care that no one more formidable than you comes out to fight him. Or one day, Agelia, the wise daughter of Adrestus and gallant wife of this horse-taming Diomedes, will hear that she has lost her husband the best of the Achaeans, and wake her household from their sleep with her lamentations. As she spoke, Dione wiped the ichor from her daughter's hand with her own. The wound healed instantly, and the sting was taken out of the pain. Athene and Hiri had missed nothing of this scene, and they seized the occasion to repay Zeus for his sarcasm. The bright-eyed goddess Athene undertook the task. Father Zeus, she said, I hope you will not take it amiss when I suggest that your Cyprian daughter must have been at work again, luring Achaean women into the arms of the Trojan whom she loves so dearly. One of these ladies evidently wears a golden brooch, and Aphrodite scratched her dainty hand on it when she was fondling her. This only drew a smile from the father of men and gods, but he called Aphrodite to his side and said, Fighting, my child, is not for you. You oversee wedlock and the tender passions. We will leave the enterprising war god and Athene to look after military affairs. While this talk was going on in heaven, Diomedes of the Loud War Cry flung himself once more at Aeneas. He knew that Apollo himself had taken him under his protection, but he cared nothing even for that great god, and persisted in his efforts to kill Aeneas and spoil him of his splendid armor. Three times he leapt at him in murderous fury and thrice Apollo thrust him back with his bright shield. But when he charged him like a demon for the fourth time, the archer god checked him with a terrible shout. Think, Tyudes, and give way. Do not aspire to be equal of the gods. The immortals are not made of the same stuff as men that walk on the ground. When he heard this, Tyudes fell back a little to avoid the wrath of the archer king, and Apollo removed Aeneas from the battlefield to the holy citadel of Pergamus, where his temple stood. There, in the spacious sanctuary, Leto and Artemis, the archeress, not only healed him, but made him more splendid than ever. Meanwhile, Apollo of the Silver Bow created a phantom which looked exactly like Aeneas and was armed as he was. Round this phantom, the Trojans and the brave Achaeans hacked at each other's leather shields. 
the great round bucklers or the light targets which they held across their breasts. But now Phoebus Apollo intervened with an appeal to the tempestuous war god. Ares. He said. Murderous Ares, butcher of men and sacker of towns. I call on you to take a hand and drive this man Tyeides from the field. He is in a mood to fight Father Zeus himself. He began by closing with Aphrodite and wounding her in the wrist, and then he flung himself like a demon at me. With that, Apollo withdrew and sat down on the heights of Pergamus, while Ares the Destroyer disguised himself as a Camus, the fiery Thracian captain, and slipped in among the Trojans to put new heart into them. He began by exhorting the royal sons of Priam, crying, Princes of the royal blood, how much longer are you going to let your men be slaughtered by the Achaeans? Till they are battering down the city gates? See where Aeneas, son of the proud Anchises, lies. A man whom we looked up to as we do to my lord Hector. Come on now and rescue our gallant comrade from this seething mass. With such words as these, he roused the fighting spirit in one and all. Sarpedon too joined in and rebuked the admiral Hector now roundly. Hector! He said. Where's the spirit he used to show? You talked about holding the city without troops or allies, single-handedly, but for your brothers and your sister's husbands. And what has become of them? I cannot see a single one. They are covering like hounds before a lion while we do the fighting, though we came in only as your allies. And it was a long, long journey that I made to reinforce you. It's a far cry from the Lycian and the Eddying Xanthus, where I left my dear wife and baby son and great possessions too which many a poor neighbor is itching to get a hold of. Nevertheless, I make Lycaeans fight, and I'm not slow to meet my men in battle. Though I own nothing here, livestock or goods, that the Achaeans could carry off. Meanwhile, you stay here and do not even tell your men to take a stand and fight for their city. Take care that you and they do not get caught like fish in the meshes of a dragnet and fall easy prey to the enemy, who may be sacking your fine city any day. You should be thinking of all this, day and night, begging your glorious allies to make a determined stand. That should be your answer to the insults that are said about you. Hector was stung by Sarpedon's rebuke. He jumped down from his chariot at once in all his armor. Swinging a pair of sharp spears in his hands, he went everywhere among his men, driving them onto the fight and rousing their martial spirit. As a result, the Trojans turned about and faced the Achaeans. But these two held their ground. They closed their ranks and were by no means put to flight. Indeed, as the infantry came to grips again and the chariots wheeled to withdraw, the dust that the horses' hooves kicked up among them into the copper sky settled down on the Achaeans and whitened them, like chaff heaps whitened by the falling dust when men are winnowing and the chaff is blown across the sacred threshing floor by the wind that auburn-haired Demeter sends to separate it from the grain. So steadily the Achaeans met the shock. But now, the fierce war god, ranging everywhere, threw a veil of darkness over the battle to help the Trojans. He was carrying out the orders he had from Phoebus Apollo of the Golden Sword. Phoebus had told him to put fresh heart in the Trojans when he saw Pallas Athene, who was on the Danaean side, withdraw. Moreover, Phoebus himself made Aeneas leave the rich shrine where he had taken sanctuary and filled the great captain with fresh valor. So Aeneas took his place once more among his comrades, who were happy to find him still alive and see him come back sound of limb and in good heart. Not that they questioned him at all, they were kept far too busy by Apollo of the Silver Bow, Ares killer of men, in strife in her unquenchable fury. The Danaeans on their side were spurred to the fight by the two Ajaxes, with Odysseus and Diomedes. They needed little encouragement. No onslaught of the Trojans shook them, however hard it was pressed home. They stood their ground, like the motionless clouds which the son of Kronos caps the mountains in calm weather when angry Boreas and all his boisterous friends are sleeping, and there are no blustering winds to send the dark clouds flying. Thus the Danaeans held firm against the Trojans and did not flinch. Agamemnon strode through the ranks and gave them every exhortation. My friends, he said, be men. Have a stout heart, and in the field fear nothing but dishonor in each other's eyes. When soldiers fear disgrace, then more are saved than killed. Neither honor nor salvation is to be found in flight. As he finished, he made a swift cast with the javelin, and struck a Trojan officer in Prince Aeneas's company called Decuon, son of Pergasus, whose habitual gallantry in the front line had made the Trojans honor him like one of Priam's sons. 
King Agamemnon hit him on the shield, which failed to keep the weapon off. The bronze point pierced it and pressed on through the belt into his abdomen. He fell with a thud, and his armor rang upon him. Aeneas replied by killing two champions on the Danaean side, the sons of Diocles, Crethon, and Orsilicus, whose father lived in the town of Fyri. Diocles was a man of substance, tracing his descent from the river god Elpheus, which flows as a broad stream through the Pylian territory. The first Orcisilus, a powerful chieftain, was a son of this river. Then came the great-hearted Diocles, who in his turn had these twin sons, Crethon and Orsilicus. He trained them in all arms, and when they were of age, they embarked with the Argives in their black ships for Troy, the land of horses, to seek satisfaction for the Atreides, Agamemnon and Menelaus. But there the adventure ended in their death. As a pair of lions are brought up by their mother in the mountain jungle to plunder the farmer's yards and prey on the cattle and the sturdy sheep till they themselves fall victim to the bronze of man, the pair met their conqueror and were felled like tall pine trees by the hands of Aeneas. The gallant Menelaus was filled with pity at their fate and dashed up through the front rank in his glittering bronze equipment, brandishing his spear. He was emboldened by Ares, who wished for nothing better than to see him fall to Aeneas. But Antilochus... The great King Nestor's son saw what Menelaus was doing and followed him into the front line, fearing that some calamity might overtake their leader and bring the whole expedition to grief. Menelaus and Aeneas were already offering fight and aiming their sharp spears at one another as Antilochus came up to his commander and took his place beside him. When Aeneas saw the two men making this united stand, he felt unable to face them for all the daring he had shown before. So Menelaus and Antilochus dragged back their dead into the Achaean lines, and after handing over the ill-starred couple to their men, went back and fought in the front rank once more. The next victim was the redoubtable Pylaemenes, commander of the gallant Paphlagonian infantry. He was standing still when the great spearman Menelaus son of Atreus struck him with a javelin, which landed on his collarbone. Meanwhile, Antilochus was dealing with his squire and charioteer, Maiden, the brave son of Atimnius, who was wheeling his powerful horses round. He hit him full on the elbow with a lump of rock, and the reins, white with their ivory trappings, dropped from his hands and fell down in the dust. Antilochus dashed in and drove his sword into the man's temple. With a gasp, he fell headlong from the well-made chariot and buried his head and shoulders in the dust. For a little while, he was stuck there, for the sand happened to be deep. Then his horses kicked him down and laid him flat on the ground. Antilochus gave them a touch of the whip and sent them off into the Achaean lines. Across the ranks, Hector had observed these two and now made towards them with a great cry. He was supported by a powerful following of the Trojans, who were led on by Ares himself and the goddess Enyo, with shameless panic in her train. Ares brandished in his hand a spear of monstrous size, and strode now in front of Hector, now behind him. When Diomedes of the Loud War Cry saw Ares, he was filled with dismay, like the improvident traveler who, after a long journey over the plain, finds his way barred by the estuary of a fast-flowing river, takes one look at the seething foam, and turns back in his tracks. Thus, Tydides fell back, but not without warning his men. My friends, he said, No wonder we've been impressed by my lord Hector's spearmanship and daring. He always has a god with him to save his skin. See there? Ares is with him now, disguised as a man. Retreat, but keep your faces to the enemy. We must not offer battle to the god. No sooner had he given this order than the Trojans were on them, and Hector killed two men, Menestes and Anchialus both veterans who were riding in one chariot. The great Telamonian Ajax was filled with pity when he saw them fall. Taking his stand close by them, he let fly with a glittering javelin and struck Amphius son of Selegus, a rich man who lived in Pasus and owned many cornfields. But destiny had taken him away from them to serve as an ally to Priam and his sons. Telamonian Ajax struck him on the belt, the long spear stuck in his abdomen, and he fell with a crash. But when illustrious Ajax ran up to strip him of his arms, the Trojans met him with a volley of glittering javelins, many of which he took on the shield. Nevertheless, he planted his foot on the corpse and dragged his bronze spear out. But he could not get the man's own arms and armor off his back. The javelins were simply too much for him. Moreover, he was afraid of being surrounded and overpowered by the eager Trojans, who faced him in formidable numbers with their spears at the ready. So they managed to drive him off. Big, sturdy, and redoubtable though he was, Ajax was shaken and retreated. Such was the struggle where the fight was hottest. Meanwhile, Lepimus, the tall and handsome son of Heracles, was brought by the stern hand of fate into conflict with the godlike Sarpedon. These two, a son and a grandson of Zeus, the cloud compeller, made at one another. 
And when they had come within range, Lepimus challenged his man. Sarpedon, counselor of Lycans, what makes you come here and then hide yourself? Do not know what a battle is. They are wrong when they call you son of Aegis bearing Zeus. You are nothing like the sons you used to have. How different by all accounts from the mighty Hercules, my all-daring lion-hearted father who once came here for Leoman's mares. With only six ships and a smaller force than ours, yet sacked Ilium and widowed its streets. Now you are a coward and your army is wasting away. You may be a strong man yourself and you have come all the way here from Lycia to bolster up the Trojans, but some good you'll do them. You are going to fall to me and pass through the gates of Hades. Laplamus, replied Sir Pedon, leader of the Lycians. You know well enough that Hercules would never have sacked Holy Ilium, but for the stupidity of one man, the hotly Lamedon, who repaid his services with insult and refused to let him have the mares he had come so far to get. As for you, I say that here and now you're going to meet your doom and die at my hands. Conquered by my spear, you will yield your life to Hades of the fabled horse and the glory to me. By way of reply to Sarpedon, the other raised his ashen shaft and the long javelins leapt from both men at one and the same time. Sarpedon struck Lepimus in the middle of the neck. The deadly spear point passed right through and the nether darkness came down on his eyes. At the same moment, Lepimus' long spear hit Sarpedon in the left thigh. The point pressed fiercely on and grazed the bone, but for a while his father saved him from destruction. The heroic Sarpedon was carried by the fight by his loyal followers. The great spear weighed him down as it was dragged along, for in their haste not one of them had noticed it, or thought of pulling the ashen shaft from his thigh so that he could use his legs. So they had their work cut out for him to see him safe. On his side, Lepimus was removed from the field by the bronze clad Achaeans. The excellent Odysseus had observed his fall, but was not to be dismayed. Indeed, it lashed him into fury, and though he was uncertain what to do, and for a moment debated whether he should start in pursuit of the son of Zeus the Thunderer, or do further execution among the Lycians, but fate did not intend the stalwart son of Zeus to fall to the sharp bronze of the brave Odysseus, and so Athene turned his fury onto the Lycian ranks. Then and there he killed Coranus, Alastor, Chromius, Alcander, Halius, Gnomon, and Pyrtanus. Indeed, the noble Odysseus would have gone on to kill yet more of the Lycians, but for the quick eye of Hector of the glittering helmet, who when he saw what was afoot, hastened to the forefront in his armor of resplendent bronze, striking terror into the Danaeans. His arrival was most welcome to Sarpedon, son of Zeus, who appealed to him in his distress. Prince Hector, rescue me, and do not leave me lying here at the mercy of the Dons. Then I shall be content to die in your city if I must, for I see I'm not meant to set eyes on my country and home again, or to bring happiness to my wife and little son. Hector of the Bright Helmet gave him no answer, but darted by. He made it his first business to thrust the Argives back and kill as many as he could. But the godlike Sarpedon was removed by his trusty men and laid under a fine oak tree sacred to Aegis bearing Zeus, where the stalwart Pelagon, his own squire, extracted the ashen spear from his thigh. A mist descended on Sarpedon's eyes and he fainted. But presently he came to. The north wind played about him and revived him from his swoon. Meanwhile, the Argives, faced by Ares and Hector in his arms of bronze, neither fled to their black ships nor counterattacked, but fell steadily back as they became aware of Ares' presence on the Trojan side. And who were the first and last of them to fall to Hector, son of Priam, and to brazen Ares? Prince Teuthras was the first, then Orestes, tamer of horses, Trechus, an Aetolian spearman, Onomaeus, Onops' son, Helenus, and Orespius of the Flashing Belt, who lived in Hylae on the shores of Lake Cephasus, where he looked after his rich estate, with other Boeotians for neighbors in a fertile countryside. When the white-armed goddess Hera saw them slaughtering Argives right and left, she could not conceal her feelings from Athena. Unsleeping child of Aegis-bearing Zeus, she said. This is disastrous. If we let the maniac Ares run amuck like this, what of the promise that we made to Menelaus when we told him he would bring down the walls of Troy before he left? Come, it is time for you and me to throw ourselves into the battle. Athena of the flashing eyes was nothing loath, so here he queen of heaven and daughter of mighty Kronos, went off to put the golden harness on her horses, while Hebe deftly got her chariot ready by fixing the two bronze wheels, each with eight spokes, on the end of the iron axle tree. The fellows of these wheels were made of imperishable gold, with bronze tires fitted on the rims, 
A wonderful piece of work. While the naves that rotate on each axle are of silver. The car itself has a platform of gold and silver straps tightly interlaced. With a double railing around it. And a silver shaft running out of the front. To the end of this pole, he be tied the beautiful golden yoke and attached the fine gold breast straps. In Hiri, all agog for the hurly-burly of war, led her fast horses under the yoke. Meanwhile, on her father's threshold, Athene, daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, shed her soft embroidered robe, which she had made with her own hands, put a tunic on in its place, and equipped herself for the lamentable work of war with the arms of Zeus, the cloud compeller. She threw round her shoulders the formidable tasseled Aegis, which is beset at every point with fear, and carries strife and force and the cold nightmare of pursuit within it, and also bears the ghastly image of a gorgon's head, the grim and redoubtable emblem of Aegis-bearing Zeus. On her head, she put her golden helmet, with its four plates and double crest, adorned with fighting men of a hundred towns. Then she stepped into a flaming chariot, gripped the huge long spear, which she breaks the noble warrior's ranks when she, the Almighty Father's child, is roused to anger. Here he lost no time. She flicked the horses with her whip, and the gates of heaven thundered open for them of their own accord. There kept by the hours, the wardens of the broad sky and of Olympus, whose task it is to close the entrance or to roll away the heavy cloud. Through these gates the goddesses drove their patient steeds. They found the son of Kronos sitting aloof from the other gods on the topmost of Olympus's many peaks. The white-armed goddess Harry brought the pair to a halt and had a word with Zeus, the son of Kronos, the Lord Supreme. Father Zeus, she said. Are you not moved to indignation by the violence of Ares and the sight of all these gallant Archaeans, whom he has slaughtered without rhyme or reason? I cannot bear to watch. But your Cyprian daughter and Apollo of the silver bow appear to like it. In fact, it suits them to have let loose this savage who acknowledges no law. Father Zeus, will you be angry with me if I give him a sound thrashing and chase him from the field? No, get to work, said the gatherer of clouds, and let our warrior Athene deal with him. No one is a better hand at twisting Ari's tail. The white-armed goddess Hera had no fault to find with this. She flicked her horses with the whip, and the willing pair flew off on a course midway between the earth and starry sky. And since these horses of the gods, with their high thundering hooves, cover at one bound the distance that a man can see into the haze as he looks from a watchtower out over the wine-dark sea, they soon reach Troy and its pair of noble rivers. There, at the water's meet of Simois and Scamander, the white-armed goddess Hera stopped her horses and released them from the yoke. She hid them in a mist, and Simois made Ambrosia spring up for them to eat. Then the two goddesses set out on foot, strutting like pigeons in their eagerness to help the Argive arms. They made for that part of the field where the pick of the Achaeans had rallied round the great Diomedes' tamer of horses, and were standing at bay like flesh-eating lions, or like wild boars who can be formidable too. There, the white-armed goddess Hiri stopped and called aloud, mimicking the noble stentor of the brazen voice, who could raise a shout like that of fifty men together. For shame, Argives! contemptible creatures, splendid only to look at. In the days when the great Achilles came out and fought, the Trojans never showed themselves in front of the Dardanian gates. They were too fearful of his heavy spear. But now they are fighting far from the town and by your very ships. Thus she emboldened them and put fresh heart into every man. Meanwhile, Athene of the flashing eyes had made straight for Diomedes, son of Tydeus. She found the prince with his chariot and horses, airing the wound that Pandarus had given him with his arrow. Under the broad shoulder strap of his round shield, the sweat was irking him. Troubled by this and weakened in the arm, he had lifted up the strap and was wiping the dark blood away. The goddess laid her hand on his horse's yoke. Tydeus had a son, she said, but how unlike himself. Tydeus was a little man, but what a fighter. He even fought when I had forbidden it and did not want him to show off, even when he was sent alone to Thebes to parley with a crowd of Cadmians. I told him then to sit and eat his dinner quietly in the palace. And what must he do but challenge the young Cadmians, like the lion-hearted man he was, and beat them all easily with the help he had from me? How different from you. I stand beside you, I shield you from harm, and I tell you to fight the Trojans with my blessing. But you are exhausted and cannot lift a finger after all you have done. Or are you paralyzed by fear? If that is the trouble, I no longer take you for a son of Tydeus and a grandson of the fearless Onius. I recognize you, goddess Athene, said the stalwart Diomedes. 
the bearer of Aegis, I can speak to you without reserve. I am not unmanned, either by fear or exhaustion. All I am doing is to keep in mind the limits you yourself imposed to me. You told me not to fight against the blessed gods, except for Aphrodite. If she came into the fight, I would wound her with my spear. But it is Ares who is carrying all before him. When I saw that, I fell back here and told my men to rally around me. My dearest Diomedes, true son of Tydeus, cried Athene of the flashing eyes. I understand, but with me at your back, you need have no fear, either of Ares or of any other god. Quick now and at him. Drive up and do not stop to think of his being the god of war, but let him have it at a short range. Look at the madam over there. Do you know that only the other day that pestilential, double-dealing villain gave here and myself his word to fight against the Trojans and help the Argives, and now he has forgotten all he said in his fighting on the Trojan side? As she spoke, she reached out, dragged Stedalus back and hustled him out of the chariot. He was only too glad to leap down. The eager goddess took his place in the car beside the noble Diomedes, and the beechwood axle groaned aloud at the weight it had to carry. A formidable goddess and a mighty man of arms. Pallas Athena seized the reins and whip, and drove the horses straight off in the direction of Ares. At that moment, Ares was despoiling the gigantic Periphus, the noble son of Ocesius, and the best man in the Aetolian force. Spattered with blood, he was busy stripping the armor from his victim, and to conceal her approach from the redoubtable god, Athene had put a cap of invisibility on her head. But when the butcher Ares saw the gallant son of Tydeus, he left Periphus to lie where he had met his death, and made straight for Diomedes' tamer of horses. When the two had come up to close quarters, Ares began the fight with what he had meant to be a mortal blow. He thrust at Diomedes with his bronze spear over the yoke in the horse's reins, but Athena of the flashing eyes, catching the shaft in her left hand, pushed it above the chariot, where it spent its force in the air. Diomedes of the loud war cry then brought his spear into play, and Pallas Athena drove it home against the lower part of Ares' belly, where he wore an apron round his middle. There, the blow landed, wounding the god and tearing his fair flesh. Diomedes drew out the spear, and brazen Ares let forth a yell as loud as the war cry of 9,000 or 10,000 battling men. The Achaeans and Trojans quaked with terror at the appalling cry from a god who had never had his fill of war. Then, like a column of black air that issues from the clouds when a tornado springs up after the heat, Diomedes, son of Tydeus, saw the brazen war god whirl up to heaven in a welter of haze. Ares traveled rapidly, and directly he reached the god's home on high Olympus. He sat down by Zeus, the son of Cronus, in a sorry frame of mind. He showed Zeus the immortal blood pouring from his wound, and told his story in a doleful voice. Father Zeus, he said, does the sight of all this violence not stir your indignation? See what we gods must suffer at each other's hand whenever it occurs to us to do mankind a favor. The fault is yours. We are all at loggerheads with you for having cursed the world with that crazy daughter of yours who is always up to some devilment or other. The rest of us, including every god on Olympus, bow to your will and stand in awe of you. But when it comes to her, you neither say nor do a thing to check the creature. You let her have her way because she is a child of your own who was born for mischief. See how she has encouraged Tydeus' son, the insolent Diomedes, to run amok among the immortal gods. He began by charging Aphrodite and cutting her wrist. And then he flung himself like a demon at me? <laughs> Happily, I am quick enough on my feet to have escaped. Otherwise, I should have had a long and painful time there among the grisly dead, or should have come away crippled for life by his blows. Zeus the Cloud Gatherer gave Ares a black look. You betrayer, he said. Don't come to me in wine. There is nothing you enjoy as much as quarreling and fighting. Which is why I hate you more than any god on Olympus. Your mother Hira too has a headstrong and ungovernable temper. I have always found it hard to control her by word of mouth alone. I suspect it was she that started this business and got you into trouble. However, I do not intend to let you suffer any longer. Since you are my own flesh and blood and your mother is my wife, but if any other god had fathered such a pernicious beast, you would have long since found yourself in a deeper hole than the sons of Oranos. Thereupon, Zeus told Paeon to heal him. Paeon spread soothing ointment on the wound and healed it, for Ares was not made of mortal stuff. Indeed, 
He made the fierce war god well in no more time than the busy fig juice takes to thicken milk and curdle the white liquid as one stirs. He be bathed him and gave him lovely clothing to put on, and he sat down by Zeus, the son of Cronus, with all his former self-esteem. Meanwhile, the two goddesses, Hiri of Argos and Alalcomenian Athene, came back to the palace of almighty Zeus. They had checked the butcher in his murderous career.